Hi, everyone. It's a pleasure and honor to be here uh, presenting alongside such illustrious scholars in uh, a wide range of disciplines that investigate the mysteries of what it's like to be human. It's really a pleasure. So I'm Samuel Vessier. I'm an assistant professor uh, in the Division of Social and Transcultural Psychiatry here at McGill, where I'm also affiliated with the uh, Department of Anthropology, and where I'm co-director of the Culture, Mind, and Brain uh, program, which brings together scholars from a uh, really broad range of disciplines like philosophy, neuroscience, anthropology, um, public health, and psychiatry, among others, again, to investigate uh, lots of complex and interesting variables in human distress and wellness and what it's like to be human. Um, so I'm here to present the outline of the cultural affordances model that we've been developing here with uh, Professor Lawrence Kameyer, uh, Maxwell Bramstead, and different colleagues. Um, I should perhaps begin by telling you a little bit about my own background as an anthropologist. So I trained as an anthropologist uh, here at McGill. I got my PhD in 2007. Um, I did a thesis in Northeast Brazil, examining the uh, modes of resilience, survival strategies, and cooperation of street children and uh, sex workers of all people. And like many of my fellow presenters here, I have a complicated relationship uh, with, with my own discipline and with interdisciplinarity. So, about five or six years after completing my PhD, um, I had something of an existential crisis about my identity as an anthropologist. So at that time, I had been working between northern Canada and the Brazilian Amazon in indigenous community development. Um, I had also written a book uh, stemming out of my PhD work. Um, looking at how really marginalized social actors like street children and racialized women in Brazil came to understand their relationship with the social, cultural, economic, political, and historical structures in which their lives were embedded. Um, I had taught and developed a broad range of courses in anthropology and social theory. Um, I taught a yearly seminar in Brazil, a PhD seminar uh, in anthropological theory, and yet, if I were to be completely honest with myself, I found that I would have been hard-pressed to explain what culture was to anyone, really, or to even formulate it, formulate it to myself. So as an anthropologist, as Carol Worthman mentioned, I had been trained to critique everything to death. Um, I was very good at pointing out that there were cultural differences. Um, I had been trained to be particularly critical of science and of psychology especially. Um, so I had nothing whatsoever, for example, to say about any possible psychological dimensions uh, that might give rise to the general phenomenon of culture. Um, so I had been tra trained to think of psychology as a really problematic discipline that was articulated around a set of concerns and realities that reflected perhaps um, something like Eurocentric, primarily white, uh, upper middle class, uh, nuclear family kinds of realities, but that really did not have much to say about the broad variety uh, of the human experience. So as I grew, more disquiet and frustrated with basically my lack of understanding of my own discipline, I decided to retrain in cognitive and behavioral sciences. Uh, and I came here at McGill, where under the mentorship of Lawrence Kameyer, uh, Ian Gold, and Amir Raz, I began uh, reinterpreting my work through a very, very different lens. So what I want to do today is basically walk you through this set of really important questions that perhaps many of us forget to ask, that perhaps many of us leave out of our research. Um, and I want to walk you in particular through a set of questions about the puzzle, the mystery of what culture is. I'll be presenting the outline of this model of cultural affordances that we hope bears some promise to try to if not fully answer the question of what it's like to be human, perhaps pose the question in interesting and precise ways. And then I'll move on to present uh, a different general theory of how cognition and culture interact. And we'll conclude with a set of methodological considerations for what to look for, how to study culture. So in this workshop, we've talked a lot about the importance of context. Indeed, it has become something of a cliche now, 
to say that, well, when we look at the biomedical sciences, when we look at public health, uh, when we look at experimental psychology, um, things like randomized controlled trial or lab controlled experiments lack ecological validity. They're not able to capture, uh, to apprehend, to comprehend any of the complex environmental factors that interact to produce context. But again, what, uh, what is context? And I think that's a really pertinent question that we need to pose in detail. So when I query uh, my students or colleagues on uh, what their definition of context is, they often summon uh, what I call the obvious dimensions. So people will mention environmental factors like say, you know, whether people live in an urban or rural environment. Uh, they might mention a set of, of daily stressors, things like pollution, uh, for example, or noise. When people are asked to define culture, they, they very often are quick to mention a set of demographic variables. So nationality, socioeconomic status, uh, gender, ethnicity, religion, sexuality, age, and so on and so forth. Okay. Now, some people who are perhaps a little more sophisticated are often attentive to factors that are a little less obvious, a little more difficult to pin down. Things like social norms, values. People sometimes call those cultural values. I'm not quite sure yet what those are. Now, to try to dig a little deeper, um, we might borrow a distinction that was famously proposed by the French social scientist Pierre Bourdieu in his Outline of a Theory of Practice, where he said, well, you know, we could look at culture, cultural forms of lives as comprising two dimensions. So one are these obvious dimensions, uh, what may be called dogma, so the set of rules and conventions um, that people know that they must do. So if you ask people, well, what are some things that you care about in your culture? How are you expected to behave? They might be able to tell you certain things, like say, we're allowed to marry uh, these people, we're not allowed to marry these people, etc. Um, but there might be we may think of this as the tip of the iceberg. So Pierre Bourdieu uh, pointed our attention towards what he termed doxa, that is all that is taken for granted in any given context or society. This is also a definition of culture uh, famously proposed by uh, Professor Alan Young, a very distinguished scholar in medical anthropology who studied, among many other things, post-traumatic disorder here at McGill, who likes to say that culture is everything that we take for granted. So that's really interesting, but again, what exactly are we talking about? And how can we go about studying it? So if we look at all these different factors, all these different variables, they're interesting. They, they cluster together in interesting ways, but again, what does that mean? This reminds me of uh, what in the medical sciences we call a syndrome, a constellation of symptoms that co-occur, uh, that are bundled together in some way, the causality of which seems a little difficult to ascertain. In fact, in my own work, I have often toyed with the idea of what we call the self uh, being basically a bundle of symptoms. So culturally specific ways of being and, and of feeling in one's body. So I want to keep walking you through this mystery for a minute. Um, we may now borrow a definition of society. Again, what is society proposed by the Cambridge anthropologist Keith Hart? And uh, he points out that society is, in fact, quite mysterious because we've lived in it uh, our whole life. It dwells inside of us in really interesting ways, but it's not ordinarily visible. Yet another, the last one, uh, I promise, uh, interesting allegory. This is from uh, a graduation speech given by the American writer David Foster Wallace when he tells the story of two fish uh, who meet one morning and the first fish asks the, the other one, hey, how's it going? Um, how's the water today? And the other fish replies, well, what is water? So what I want us to investigate today together is precisely this, this invisible water in which we dwell and that lives inside us, but that we're somehow not able to notice. So yeah, it is really that taken for granted aspect that I want us to investigate. Now, for me, and this is really one of the key take home points from my presentation today, is that the most important 
dimension of culture, the most important definition of culture. What it is that we must understand and look for is basically other minds. Whatever culture or context is, is something that comes about through our relationship with actual and imagined other minds. And I'm going to proceed to explain this through a variety of examples. If I were to give my presentation in under a minute, however, I would choose uh, a Japanese haiku. Uh, and I would choose this particular haiku written by uh, Mayuzumi Madoka, who's a contemporary poetess. She's a female poet who now lives in Paris, um, who brings to our attention a really interesting moment in the genealogy of a love story, perhaps. So she tells of, uh, of a person who's choosing a swimsuit and starts imagining herself through the perspective of her lover. So I'll invite you to pause for a second and consider just how wonderfully intricate, complex, but also poetic this is, and how this in many ways exemplifies what it is like to be human. This ability that we as a species have to project ourselves through the perspective of others, to see through the eyes of other people, to feel through the feelings of others. So here, we're beginning to see, we're beginning to paint the picture of a really complex, uh, intersubjective, embodied, affective kind of reality that comes about through the relationship that we form with one another, and in particular, through one expectations that we come to form about one another. So a more precise definition of context and cultural context might be, well, something to do with expectations about other minds. And in particular, how expectations come to be shared. So I unfortunately lack the time to give you the full story of the intellectual genealogy of the cultural affordances model and the many intellectual traditions uh, on which we draw, uh, but we're in particular interested in opening up a conversation between different fields of inquiry on the human experience that typically uh, investigate the same questions but don't read the same books and don't use the same language. So on the one hand, there are schools of phenomenology in the philosophy of mind, phenomenology being, of course, the investigation of lived experience, um, in particular, uh, more recent enactivist or 4EA accounts of the philosophy of mind, so understanding of the mind as being embodied, enacted, extended, um, and embedded. Uh, we draw, as we will see in a minute, on ecological psychology, so we also try to bring this embodied, extended, affective mind into a broader ecology, into a broader uh, environment. Uh, we draw a lot on the cultural phenomenology uh, pioneered, well, here in this very department by Professor Kumayer and colleagues, but uh, unlike many of our colleagues in the enactivist phenomenological camps, we're also very interested in the analytic, what the analytic tradition might bring to the table, in particular what developmental psychology and cognitive anthropology, in particular uh, through recent cultural evolution models, uh, might bring to the table. So in doing so, we also borrow or revisit uh, Gricean approaches in the philosophy of mind that are very interested in uh, the idea of meaning coming about through intentions, the idea of social intentions, meaning coming about through what we can pick up on what others intend to convey. And a final uh, rather recent body of work in computational neuroscience and theoretical biology that we also bring to the table is the recent understanding of the brain as basically being a prediction machine, uh, being a Bayesian statistical prediction machine to be more precise, or uh, from another language um, that we borrow from theoretical physics, um, the mind and living systems in particular having something to do with attempting to minimize surprise and to save energy. So I like the time to go in detail in these really interesting predictive processing and variational dimensions of our model. But suffice it to say that these models, however complex they may sound, they basically uh, bring a little bit of mathematical precision to a very, very old philosophical story. A philosophical story, I might point out, which is found in many different cultural traditions. So um, the idea that reality is basically an illusion. 
So this is, of course, a story that we find in, in, in Vedic, Indic, and in, in Buddhic philosophies. We also find it in, in, in Platonic Western philosophies, uh, famously epitomized in Plato's Allegory of the Cave. So what we see and take and hold to be real is a mere illusion, a mere projection. Uh, the psychoanalytic and psychodynamic story on this is also that, well, reality is a projection of our own fears and our own desires. But suffice it to say here that we don't encounter the world as it is, but as we expect it to be. And on this, the predictive processing and vario uh, variational free energy models have uh, a lot to say. What is often missing, or so we find, in these recent predictive processing accounts is precisely the intersubjective dimension. In particular, the role of other people. These models may be uh, a little too individualistic. So how we outsource our expectation to other people around us is a really important picture that we need to slowly draw out together. So. When we talk about, when we get to the methodological part of this talk, when we talk about, well, how do we go about studying culture, particularly if people themselves don't even know how and why they are enculturated, what it is, what is it that we must look at? Well, expectations. In particular, the process of outsourcing expectations and cultural information to relevant others. And we'll talk about dimensions of salience, how things become, in a sense, automatic, how there are some aspects of the world that people attend to automatically, and valence. Uh, so valence is a way to talk about phenomenology, what it feels like to be human in a particular context, but also, well, simply how good or how bad does it feel? And as we will see, thinking of cultural affordances in terms of salience and valence is a very interesting, we hope, productive way to think about uh, wellness and distress, for example. So let's proceed and now uh, certainly moving away from anthropological definitions that, that simply list off a set of differences. Um, we may borrow a definition of culture from the biological um, sciences. So we know we can speak of culture when we can notice that members of the same species develop different ways of doing things different ways of doing things that are durable over time and that are widely shared. So within one group people do things differently from the other group. And when we have every reason to believe that these differences are not caused uh, by biology simply, but arise through social learning, then we may speak of culture. So this is just, again, uh, a, a, that definition we're pointing out. We know that uh, culture does that. How does it come about is a very, very complicated question. Um, so here I'll briefly mention um, some of the basic mechanisms, the cognitive mechanisms in particular, uh, that have been posited to play a key role in how culture comes about. Um, well, joint intentionality, sometimes referred to as theory of mind. The ability that humans have, and we have every reason to believe more so than any other species, to make inferences about what other people expect of them, to infer, care about other people's mental states, other people's needs. So from this, from this ability that we have to make inferences about what we, what each other want and desire, rises the ability to form joint goals and to engage in very large scale, coordinated, patterned, meaningful action. But the question, of course, is still, how exactly does that come about? Because if you think about different cultural groups acquiring different beliefs, different preferences, different tastes, without explicit instruction, without ever being told, you must believe X or you must like X, with very limited possibilities of direct imi imitation and interaction with one another, yet, people come to adopt very culturally, historically, context-specific ways of feeling, ways of thinking, and ways of doing things that are rather similar, eerily similar to those of others around them. How does that come about? So perhaps another very pertinent question would be, well, where is culture? How deep does it run exactly? 
And again, is it out there in the world? Is it in the head? Is it in the body? These are such fascinating questions that we often forget to ask. So what we should do now is, is try to consider in ourselves just how deep culture runs and how deeply our very uh, assumptions and intuitions are permeated by culturally specific dimensions that we ourselves are not very aware of. So this is a famous task in, so in social psychology where participants are shown three faces. Uh, one of them is described as black, the other one is ambiguous, and the third one is described as white. Now, in the next moment, participants are asked to identify the person with the darkest shade of skin. You won't be surprised when I tell you that most people identify this person right there on your left um, as the people with the darkest shade of skin. It appears obvious, doesn't it? It so happens, however, that all three pictures have exactly the same shade, same color, same shading. So what's going on? So look again. I suspect that many of you here continue to perceive the forehead of the person on your left as much darker than the other three. So what's going on? It seems that simply by being primed, by being, the, what is it? Is it the word black? Is it the fact that we come to associate a set of phenotypic features, perhaps a slightly larger nose with the skin that we associate to be darker? And then again, on the predictive processing account, your brain uh, basically predicts what comes next and produces an, Im an image that appears darker to you. So this may appear uh, to be only a benign optical illusion, however, as decades of research in the psychology of implicit bias has shown, there's an entire set of ethical and social problems that are embedded in what we just saw. Um, so uh, this is a reference to uh, the famous doll experiment pioneered by Richard and Mamie Clark in the 1960s at the time of the civil rights trials where, and I encourage you, to try this tragic experiment at home, but when children older than four or five are shown these two babies and are told which one is the good baby, which one is the bad baby, or which one is the smart baby, or which one is the dumb baby, invariably children who are raised in the West point to the white baby as being the good one and as being the, the, smart, the smart one. Worryingly, even minority children, so children who are socially constituted as adopting a minority position, largely based on social conventions, also identify the white baby as being the good ones. So now we're beginning to understand the mystery of how people acquire beliefs and tastes uh, in perhaps a more sophisticated manner. It is as though there's a set of values that are ultimately arbitrary. I mean, we know certainly from biological sciences that race is only a social construct. There is no relationship, as we know, between skin color, say, and intelligence. However, people make a set of automatic assumptions based on these traits that symbolically come to acquire meaning. And people, what is more worrying, come to internalize their own position vis-a-vis this dominant cultural convention. So if you grow up as a white child, it's all good, right? Because you can associate yourself with being the smart and good one. But what if you grow up, what if you're socially, historically, economically constituted as, as a minority? But now let's recap. So there are certain cues, things like uh, skin color, for example, that are automatically assigned with meaning, so expected attributes, and valence goodness or badness. And these cues, they seem to trigger fully embodied, affective, and enacted schemas. Now the question, again, how are these learned? Let's go briefly through a, a, a few more examples to appreciate just how deeply culture permeates our, assu our assumptions, and then we'll be able to, together, uh, build a kind of a model to understand how that works. So this is another uh, famous task in social psychology. Ask yourself, how many of each kind of animal did Moses take on the ark? I'm sure many of you are guessing that you're being tricked right now. Um, the answer, of course, is none. It was not Moses, but it was Noah um, who took the animals on the ark. Or so it goes in the biblical story. Now, what exactly does this have to do with culture? 
the task, uh, the Moses question, is uh, a known measure of analytical reasoning and intuitive errors known as the one item Moses task illusion. Something that I endlessly find fascinating is when I assign this particular question as a bonus exam question in a large class of undergraduates, I often find that Chinese students get it right. So at first I used to ask myself, well, what's going on? Why do the Chinese students get it right? Is it because they're raised with a set of uh, specific values about education that make them pay more attention? That's probably not it. Imagine that growing up in a place where you're not very familiar with Abrahamic stories and you have to invest conscious effort in remembering, wait a minute, who was this Moses guy again? It would probably be obvious to you that it was not Moses, but Noah who brought the animals on the ark. So the idea here is that uh, whatever, and this is a very well-studied bias in cognitive psychology, whatever comes to mind automatically, whatever is easily retrievable in memory, does not involve any kind of effortful uh, cognitive mechanism. It does not involve any kind of conscious mental effort. So cognitive psychologists study this as the ways in which intuitive errors come about. That's very interesting. But cognitive anthropologists um, have a different take on the matter. They tend to understand this as what they call the frequency bias. So ideas that come to mind automatically, well, they don't come out of nowhere. They don't come out of a vacuum. They tend to reflect ideas, assumptions, expectations, as we will see, that are culturally widespread. So, this is interesting. The idea of culturally white, widespread uh, intuitions and expectations is something we will return to uh, towards the end of the talk when we discuss methodological ways of studying culture, of studying shared expectations in particular. So yeah, we've already posed the questions in many ways. Uh, how is it that people develop similar beliefs, similar tastes, and worryingly or not, beliefs and tastes that, however arbitrary they might seem, people care about to such a dramatic extent that they would easily be ready to kill or die in the name of these socially constituted beliefs. So we now get to the very interesting notion of affordances, and we're going to start talking about culture uh, as affordances. So what is an affordance? The notion of affordance was made famous by the uh, psychologist James Gibson in his work on the ecology of visual perception. The idea of affordance is an interesting way uh, to explore, again, an old philosophical question um, about, for example, meaning. So say Aristotle, the philosopher, used to say, things in and of themselves has no meaning, have no meaning. Language has meaning, but things have they have attributes, they have properties. Okay. So an affordance is a way to think about the properties of things in the environment and what the environment makes possible. So simply put, an affordance is a property that a thing or a feature of the environment might readily offer without needing to learn, without needing to have in particular, as we will see, social learning. That was the traditional idea about affordances. So a cup, for example, has the property drinkability, potability. A cup affords drinking. A chair affords sitting. A wall affords uh, not going through. Of course, a perhaps more sophisticated take on affordances is that things don't just have direct properties for everyone and anyone. They have interactional properties based on the dispositions of the organisms that interact with different things. So a cup affords drinking, sure, but it affords drinking uh, for agents or for organisms that have, well, a hand to be able to pick up the cup. So with opposable thumbs, of course, you also need a mouth, you need a stomach, you need to be an organism that needs water, etc. And indeed, a chair affords sitting, well, for bipedal organisms. So for humans, uh, for some apes, it might, but it does not afford sitting for, I don't know, for an amoeba or for a plane. So yeah, affordances describe possibilities for action in an ecological niche. So we can think of, a, of an environmental niche as being co-constructed between organisms and things uh, and features of the environment. <clears throat> 
the thing about affordances is that they were left out uh, of the anthropological literature, of the cognitive anthropological literature, and largely of the psychological literature because it was assumed that affordances were simply things that could be readily discovered by organism in their, in their environment, but that did not really apply to culture. Because culture, by definition, uh, requires symbolic conventions, require things that need to be learned from others, so not affordances. In the developmental psychology literature, for example, there's, uh, there's a small debate on the extent to which uh, chimpanzees and bonobos exhibit forms of culture. So chimpanzees and bonobos have been observed using uh, different kinds of rudimentary tools, like sticks uh, to obtain termites in different termite mounds. And the consensus errs on the size of non-social affordances. Basically, these are things that chimpanzees from generation to generation can individually rediscover. There's not much of a need for teaching or social learning. So affordances, or so it was thought, don't really apply to humans because humans learn things conventionally and symbolically. We don't really understand how that happens, but they're not affordances. But let's just examine uh, briefly, for example, what this picture, what this image affords. So when I ask a group of undergraduate students, uh, what does this afford? People will say, well, it affords uh, respect. Um, a student tie is, is a widely recognized symbol of a status symbol. OK, sure. But as we will see, if you introduce, say, different cues, uh, different indices, then it might afford something else altogether. So with the presence of, say, these two glasses, now the status the affordance status of the person wearing a suit seems to shift to something a little more subordinate. This affords being served. But now, examine again if you're bringing something like, say, a walkie-talkie. Uh, what does this afford? Um, so it affords maybe a sense of safety for some people. But then again, and this is crucial, and we're going to keep brainstorming these examples together, depending on how one is socially positioned, the affordance there will be very different. So say, uh, let's think back to those really tragic experiments in the psychology of implicit bias. Suppose uh, that you are from a minority group that is very, very tragically used to experiencing systematic discrimination. This might afford fear. You might pick up on an affordance of danger. And so it goes even for a suit and tie neutrally. Depending on your own social positioning, you might feel that this is a, something of a conspecific a colleague, or you might feel intimidated. So it appears as though these different symbolic affordances are stable enough for some people, depending on how they are positioned. But the question of how they are learned and how they come to hold with something of a pattern precision for different groups of people remains. It's an important question. We need to keep posing it. So we should also pause to examine the ways in which different environments, different contexts, different objects, as we have seen, they, have different, they may have different affordances for different people. But in fact, there's a wide, perhaps infinite possibility of affordances that they also might hold. They might also change over time. And there might be some patterning in this picture. So how does this work? So we've seen a chair afford sitting. OK, you need to be a bipedal person or agent or organism. But what about specific kinds of chairs? What about a chair like this, a throne? A throne affords not sitting for all but the monarch. But if you think about it, whether it's a throne or a chair, uh, a chair, say, in a lecture hall, they also afford doing lots of things. I could get up on the chair and do a backflip. I could pick up the chair and throw it in one of my colleagues' face. Um, or I could just stand up on the chair the whole time. My body and the chair have combinatory possibilities that make this affordance possible. Yet none of us do that. For the most part, most of us know how to use chairs in moment-specific, context-specific, ritual-specific, even gender-specific ways of sitting. So people come, they enter a lecture hall, and they know how to sit in ritually appropriate way, how to listen, how to not throw the chair in my face, how to not get up and sit on the chair from which I am lecturing. But then again, suppose I'm lecturing, and all of a sudden I leave for five, 10 minutes, the students grow a little disquiet, most of them leave, 
then what happens to the affordance status of the chair on which I was sitting? Well, some of them might actually sit on it. So the affordance status will change. As we will see, perhaps it has something to do with the people, be they actual or imaginary, who are around, the people who are likely to enforce a social rule. So we'll return to that. So we've already briefly visited some of these examples, but I want you to keep considering again how uh, the same environment might afford very different things to different people depending on how they are socially positioned. So here, this is uh, another iteration on the status symbol the, uh, scenario. So what does a university afford, for example? What does walking through a university on a Sunday afternoon afford? Well, uh, for one person, say S1 here, uh, might be a high status person, a high status university educated person. S2 here might be a person um, who did not have access to university education, who is largely perceived by others uh, in his or her society as having a low status uh, based on some markers like uh, symbolic markers, of course, like, like dress, forms of speech, accent, and so on and so forth. So for the university educated subject number one, the university uh, might afford a sense of pride, a sense of comfort, a sense of communion, a sense of being among her peers. For the second subject, walking through the university might afford a sense of anxiety, a sense of shame. So for both subject number one and subject number two, the instant neurobiological response to interacting with the university will be very different. One of them might have a stress response, perhaps even a fight or flight, and the other one uh, might have, I don't know, an oxytocin release. So again, how does that come about? Why does the same world have radically different affordances for different people, and is there some patterning? Is there a rule, and how are those rules learned? I want to keep drawing your attention um, to the dimension of salience. Salience being uh, whatever jumps to mind automatically, whatever we attend to automatically. As I'm going to keep uh, arguing and attempting to explain, cultural affordances being encultured has something to do with the selective patterning of attention. And in particular, the outsourcing of salience to people from our own groups. So now we're beginning to define a cultural group as a group of people united by shared expectations and a group of people who largely implicitly, largely automatically, will attend to the same features of, envir of the environment and who will derive an embodied response and modes of action readiness that are roughly similar, roughly patterned, based on the groups to which they belong. So here briefly, uh, a final social status scenario. We have uh, our subject number one high status, our subject number two low status, who are walking in a dark alley, um, perhaps at night. Um, so subject number one first automatically attends to the presence of subject number two. Subject number one may not think of herself as being particularly racist. However, as social psychology demonstrates, she has internalized a set of implicit biases whereby she automatically associates the symbolic marker uh, that are wrapped around the low status subject number two as signaling some kind of threat or danger. She thinks, oh, that person might mug me, but rather subliminally, rather subconsciously. So automatically, the first subject sees the low status person, uh, gets an instant reaction of fear, and then scanning the environment, notices the presence of the policeman and feels reassured. So implicitly, Subject number one has assumed, okay, now I'm safe. So the affordance status of the dark alley has changed based on the presence of the policeman. Now, subject number two, who is used uh, to being the recipient of all kinds of discrimination, who is used to being read as signaling some kind of threat, even though she herself uh, might be completely inoffensive, does not even notice subject number one. The first feature of the environment of the dark alley that she notices is the policeman, and her instant reaction, again, is fear. Oh, that person is probably out to get me. What have I done? 
So in order to understand how that comes about, in order to better understand this really strange, but as we will see, pattern process of outsourcing our expectations to others, be they real, like for example, I see the policeman there, or imagined people generalized like me, others, will return to this, we need to examine a little more how ordinary consciousness and cognition works. How does the mind work? This is a really, really fascinating question that we're all trying to wrap our heads around, uh, no pun intended. So the question I might ask you now is, well, what goes on in people's minds from moment to moment and from context to context? And these are, as we have seen, really, really, really difficult questions to study. So we might attempt to answer these questions by looking at a few proxy examples. Uh, in particular, the emerging literature on daydreaming and mind wandering, uh, dreaming as well, as one particular working of the unconscious, as it were. Uh, and also, a few examples about delusion. So, the mind, when it's not working very well, uh, might actually give us some clues about how it works when it works well. So, whether mind wandering is good or bad for you, adaptive or maladaptive, is a hotly debated question. There are people who think that mind wandering is great. It's a way for you to sort of, you know, replenish your cognitive resources. Others understand it as, as a form of distraction. But still, mechanistically, how does it work? We're not sure. However, uh, neuroscientists and phenomenologists are uh, becoming more and more aware that most of the time our mind is wandering. And by a wandering mind, I mean when our mind is not actually paying attention to the task at hand or to what's going on. So right now, um, many of you are listening to me. Most of you are not, or most of you are only half listening to me. Most of you are thinking about your grocery list or your uh, next camping trip, as we'll see. So this is um, an example that, um, that Zachary Irving, a uh, mind-wandering researcher, says, says, let's say you're walking to the grocery store. At first, your mind wanders to a plethora of ideas. You think about your new shirt, a joke you heard, an upcoming ski trip. Then your thoughts become automatically constrained. You start to worry about a looming work deadline. Uh, and then you realize that your worries are making you miserable. So you deliberately constrain your thoughts, and you force your mind back to grocery shopping. This seems a, a fairly plausible uh, depiction of a series of mind moments that we've all experienced. Now, I would like us to carefully examine this micro phenomenology uh, of mind moments. So, the person is walking, attempting to think about the grocery list, her mind gets distracted, thinking about a new shirt, a joke she heard, her next trip, a work deadline, and a grocery list. Okay but a new shirt, and now let's think back to this beautiful haiku poem of trying on a bathing suit through the eyes of our lover. So it is quite possible, it is likely that in thinking about buying a new shirt, uh, the person might also think, oh, well, how would so-and-so like me wearing this particular shirt? A shirt bought with whom, for whom, for whose eyes, projected through the eyes of whom? A joke you heard, yeah, from whom? Or you may also be uh, practicing, rehearsing how you're going to tell a joke. To whom? Your next trip, with whom? Looming work deadline, well, that's obvious. Owed to whom? And again, note here the status of the person. Uh, this idea of monitoring, this idea of outsourcing our expectation to people who have some kind of authority, which is uh, a really important part of this picture that we're going to keep returning to. The grocery list, again, for whom? We'll return to this. Now, in a recent uh, experience sampling study of daydreaming, researchers found that a, a broad majority of participants' daydreaming scenario were basically dedicated to rehearsing social scenarios, like imaginary conversations, for example. And one of the conclusions from this review was that this mechanism served an important purpose for social and emotional adjustment. So, that's one of the hypotheses, because if our mind wanders so much, if it wanders most of the time, is it that A, our minds are poorly designed and that mind wandering is maladaptive, or is it rather that mind wandering serves a very adaptive function? And if so, which? 
So let's keep thinking a little more about this idea of social rehearsal, this idea that in ordinary consciousness and cognition, we're constantly rehearsing, being social beings, we're constantly rehearsing our affective relationships with others. Let's look briefly then as evolutionary theories of dreaming. Why do we dream? It's a really complicated question that I'm not competent myself to answer. Uh, however, there have been different theories. One of them, which is, I should point out, somewhat outdated now, is the idea of threat rehearsal. So if we have so many nightmares, if our dreams are so emotionally charged, is because we need to rehearse complicated survival-related scenarios. Um, from another more psychoanalytic angle, uh, we might note that a lot of the scenarios that are rehearsed in dream are, well, they involve other people, invariably, and they're very affectively often, but not always sexually charged. So we may also be uh, rehearsing courtship. We may be rehearsing, um, basically, reproduction. So these are all interesting candidate theories for the evolutionary purpose of dreaming. We might at this point still be honest and remain ag agnostic about the, the precise function. We may simply note that dreams almost invariably mm, offer social scenarios. So we may also simply posit a general social rehearsal theory of dreaming. So the unconstrained mind the unconstrained, unconscious mind at play in dreaming, what does it do? It rehearses different social scenarios. Um, let's look now briefly at uh, the feeling of being watched, which as we know, when it becomes overexcited, we may speak of as being psychopathological, like say in delusions, more about which in a minute, or in schizophrenia. But one of the hypotheses, for example, and this may seem far-fetched, but you will see the connection about the origins of religion in particular and beliefs in spirits and beliefs in gods is that the feeling of being watched is completely normal. So there's a large body of literature in the cognitive science of religion that looks at the human ability to project intentionality and mental features to things that don't actually have minds. So this is why we have animism in some cultures or why we have things like spirits and gods that are assumed to basically think like humans. So according to the supernatural monitoring hypothesis in the cognitive science of religion, well, we fashion our gods and spirits to better flesh out the imaginary agents that guide our ordinary cognition, consciousness, and action. So it becomes a really convenient, really effective way, for example, for systems of morality and social norms to be internalized by a large group of people. If you feel like God has a certain set of expectations about you and is watching you all the time, well, that it makes it easier um, for people to coordinate large scale. So recently, my colleague Mariah Stendhal and I uh, uh, wrote a review of uh, why we are addicted to smartphones and social media in particular. And uh, we proposed a, a social monitoring hypothesis and a hypernatural social monitoring hypothesis. So why are most people addicted to cell phones? We claim, well, because they afford a hungry platform for social monitoring, for watching others and for being watched by others. And our hypothesis is that it is completely, absolutely normal, desirable, indeed necessary for humans um, to feel like they're being monitored, watched, judged, appraised by others. So we may think of posting selfies and obsessively monitoring the amounts of likes we're getting on Instagrams as a little pathological, but we may also think of it as a fundamentally normal propensity uh, without which we would be completely incapable of deriving meaning and value and an identity in our lives. So what happens online, uh, I lack the time to tell you the full story now, is simply a question of scale, a question of speed, a question of intensity. We do it too much uh, and too often, and of course, um, well, to make a long story short, it can stress us out. I lack the time to tell you this, fu this full story. Um, but why I mention this particular story is, again, to think about this idea of ordinary thinking and, and the basic building mechanisms of the mind having something to do with constantly rehearsing a relationship with others, with constantly rehearsing social scenarios.
So very briefly now, uh, this is taken from um, our colleague Ian Gold's uh, brilliant book on how culture shapes madness, written with his brother Joel Gold, uh, who's a psychiatrist at Bellevue in New York, where um, they propose a general evolutionary theory of delusions, so when the mind is not working very well, and they attempt to reclassify all the known kinds of, of delusions that have been documented uh, to occur across cultures. So, uh, briefly, there are delusions of grandeur, erotom erotomaniac delusions, delusions of controls, somatic delusions, and so on and so forth. Um, briefly put, what Ian and his brother point out is that the fil conducteur, the common thread across and between all these delusions is that they're always about other people. They're always about the relationship between the self and other people. So from this, my colleagues and I are attempting to articulate what we call a general social rehearsal theory of ordinary cognition. This idea that over the course of development, which is cognitive but also social, because we learn to become social in general ways, we cannot exist as humans, we cannot, uh, we cannot even have language, we cannot develop an identity and a sense of self-worth without others, without being social. We learn to see the world through the perspective of other people. Like our poetic lover in the haiku, learning to see herself uh, through the eyes of her lover. And we, in order to derive, to know what to do from context to context, to know whether we're supposed to sit on the chair, stand up on it, or do a backflip from it, uh, we intuitively imagine context-relevant people or agents that guide us through our everyday action. So the very, very simple formula to explain this is in the back of our minds, and we have every reason to believe completely subconsciously, we have something of a script that goes like this. What would so-and-so expect me to do? What would so-and-so think, feel, or expect me to do? Or perhaps, because we're going to need to return to this question of whom do we outsource our expectations to? What kinds of people? Is it just from anyone, or is there a hierarchy? Are there people who have more authority? So, I often like to summarize the formula as something like, well, what would mommy want me to do? Because it is very likely that over the course of cognitive and social development, we initially learn to outsource the most relevant and salient expectations to our primary caregivers and then to other authority figures, as we will see. So from this, we get our general formula uh, of how cultural affordances come about uh, in development, but also how they come about from moment to moment and from context to context. And the formula is three orders of automatic intentionality. So intentionality, again, has something to do with the aboutness of a thought, uh, the, the capacity of the mind to have propositional attitudes, to think about, to be about something. And here we think it is social through and through, and it involves three orders of intentionality. So the formula is something like, I think, they think, I, I think. What would others want me to do in this particular context? Of course, um, I like the time, again, to tell you the full story. There is indeed a lot of room for improvisations. Um, so we need to leave the improvisation picture um, out for a second. We should now talk a little more about the process of outsourcing expectations to relevant people and ask again, well, to whom do we outsource expectations? Because it seems, again, that people, depending on how they're socially constituted, tend to acquire a similar set of expectations that yield similar affordances based on their group, large group, and subgroup affiliation. So we should now pause to think a little about the in-group and out-group dynamics that are also very, very well documented in uh, evolutionary and social psychology. So as you know, and Carol Worthman talked a bit about this in, in, in her presentation, one of the things that humans are really, really skilled at doing, even human children without explicit instruction, is identifying who are people from my group and who are people from the other group. And one thing that is very efficient in terms of information processing, but that may be ethically problematic uh, in, in lots of scenarios, is that humans are also very good at intuitively liking people that they associate with the in-group and having strong dislike 
even disgust at times for people that they associate with the out group. And of course, social, social psychologists have amply documented this effect in the, in fact, arbitrary ways in which in-group and out-group uh, dynamics can be created very quickly experimentally. So for example, if participants are given, are sorted into two groups, and one group wears blue t-shirts and the other group wears red t-shirts, it is very easy quickly to create a sense of solidarity among the blues and among the reds, and a sense of rivalry and a sense of competition. So it is very likely then that in outsourcing a set of expectations, what would others want me to do? Uh, what would others want me to feel? In the background somewhere, we're also thinking, well, how am I supposed to not behave like the out group? Another formula um, that I'm fond of talking about is that cognition is already fake news. What do I mean by this? Well, the mind is already not just very skilled, but extraordinarily hungry uh, at and about outsourcing large chunks of nested information without having to invest any kind of conscious effort to people that they can associate with their in-group. So it seems that the information in the world that we will come to trust is extremely affectively charged and is valence, it's either good or bad, it feels good or it feels bad, and it's either associated with people with trust or with people we don't trust. So there's an extensive body of literature now um, using such paradigms as uh, natural pedagogies or, or cultural evolution. The works of uh, the cognitive anthropologist Joe Henrik in particular is really interesting in terms of thinking of this process of how humans intuitively figure out and learn not just what to learn, not just how to behave from others, but also whom to learn from. So here we're thinking about, uh, we're still talking about these mechanisms of salience. Uh, we have been describing a culture, a cultural group as people united by shared expectations, people who have their attention selectively patterned in particular ways, a group of people who selectively will tend to attend to the same kind of stimulus and not attend to other things, like say, the high status subject who attends to the low status subject in the dark alley and the low status subject who attends first to the police person. So the mind's ability to zero in on relevant cues and then to just stop processing and to completely act automatically. So one of the notions uh, that we have been articulating with Lawrence Kamayer and Maxwell Ramstead is what we like to call an epistemic authority. So epistemic having something to do with knowledge, the kinds of knowledge, the kinds of information, as it were, that we will tend to trust. So we like to define epistemic authority as a person, a cue, or even a culturally available memory association, something that will come to mind automatically. That is, again, assigned automatic salience. It just jumps to mind automatically, and then it directs action automatically. So a cue or person, or an imaginary association with a person, as we will see again, that possesses the power to prescribe meaning and action. We're very interested in, in fleshing out different types, uh, different typologies, different hierarchies, perhaps, of epistemic authorities, but it seems to me that there are not that many. So in trying to understand what it is that our minds will jump to, what it is that will prescribe action, it has something to do yeah, with salience, it has something to do for humans, because as we have seen, we have been painting a social picture, it has something to do with status. So one of the things, and here we need to turn to developmental psychology again to try to understand what it is, for example, that children seem intrinsically motivated to learn, intrinsically interested in. Children, what will they attend to? Well, status. This is something that across cultures, across ages, we're all very, very good at ad identifying people who in any given context have some kind of status. Now, I understand that particularly in an age of political correctness where we, we might normatively want for the world not to come prepackaged in hierarchies. Uh, we might be normatively interested in how we 
we all ought to be the same, we all ought to be equal. Um, I should point out that this is not a, a moral story, and if it is the moral aspect of the story that worries you, status does not have necessarily something to do with dominance, and certainly not with sheer physical dominance. So Joseph Henrik, again, has written very, very eloquently about the evolution of status and the evolution of prestige uh, among humans, and he points out that unlike our distant cousin, the apes, prestige and status for humans is symbolically conferred. It is not necessarily, and in fact, very often not conferred through sheer physical force. So Joe Henrik likes to say, look at Stephen Hawkins, for example. Many of us like to out outsource our understanding of uh, cosmology and the physics of the universe to Stephen Hawkins. He does not need to beat his chest and beat us into submission to get us to believe this. There are other mechanisms that get us to trust certain sources of information and not others. So sure, the prestige, the prestige associated with certain universities, with certain forms of speech, with certain academic journals. But these are symbolically conferred in the sense that we all implicitly agree to abide by a social convention that assigns more prestige to say one form of dress over another, one style of speech over another, whereby in the grander scheme of things from a natural ontological perspective, there is nothing better or higher uh, about, say, you know, wearing a blazer and a suit to wearing a cut-off tank top. These are just symbolic conventions. So status and prestige for humans is mostly symbolically assigned, symbolically ascribed, but humans, even children, are usually unusually skilled, usually unusually, are very skilled at knowing in any given context who's cool, who's in, who's fashionable, who has expertise. So there might be a few evolutionarily older proxies uh, for prestige, but what I'm trying to explain here is that in order to function in any given cultural setting, and uh, we, we, we can think of the example of moving across cultures, going to a new country, learning a language, learning a set of conventions, we need to identify high fidelity, high quality information. And in order to do that, we need to associate it with specific people who have a higher kind of status, who have more prestige. So, one evolutionarily older uh, proxy might be age. Uh, often, but as we will see, not always, people who are older, elders, are known to be repositories of useful knowledge, so we will often tend to trust someone who is older as opposed to someone who is younger. But that depends on the cultural domains. And it has been shown experimentally that, say, uh, when people are asked to learn a new task together or to figure out how to do some things, they might tend to intuitively trust the person who's older, but if they notice that another person is better at doing something, has more skill, then they will trade age for expertise. So again, notice the ways in which uh, a, a six-year-old um, going to a party will be able to tell you who's a good dancer and who's a bad dancer even in a style of music or a style of dance that the child knows almost nothing about. And so here we might think of the predictive processing brain again, the ability of the brain to pick up on patterns of statistical regularities and to pick up on the ones that flow best. Okay, so I have begun to paint a little bit more of a precise picture of what culture is, culture being for all intents and purposes, a set of affordances that are uh, very varied, depending on who you are, depending on how you're socially positioned, but that are patterned in particular ways. And I have attempted to describe the psychological mechanisms, the intersubjective mechanisms, through which these affordances come to hold. So, and by intersubjective inter mechanisms, I mean in particular the ability that we have to outsource relevant information to relevant authoritative others who may be able to uh, teach us how to enforce a particular social rule. So let's examine briefly again a few more scenarios just so you can appreciate how wonderful, how strange, how mysterious it is, but also how patterned and how ultimately understandable it all is. So we've talked a lot about how affordances differ uh, by social group, depending on your group affiliation, but let's talk a little bit about how the similar 
a similar environment might also yield and offer different affordances over time, even throughout the course of a day or even throughout the course of an hour for one particular agent. And so based on the kinds of social conventions as well that the agents might have internalized. And here by social convention, I am pointing to the doxastic. I'm pointing to the not so much the dogma, not so much the social conventions that people are able to um, talk about, like say, I am expected to marry someone of my own kind, or I'm expected to become a doctor, but the ones that are taken for granted, but that may, however, be best described as social conventions. So here I am interested in uh, cross-cultural differences in uh, child behavior, cross-cultural differences in fussiness in particular, and I'm in particular interested in what I like to call the bedtime ritual and the anxiety that surrounds the bedtime ritual. Now, why is it that in some cultures, some children are able to go to bed uh, well late or early, or some people are able to go to bed easily, and in others, not so? So again, could it be that it's universal? Is it that children are universally afraid of the dark and this is why they find it difficult to go to sleep? Or are there ways in which fussiness um, might be culturally patterned, might be a doxastic, implicit, taken for granted uh, cultural convention? So what does a child's bedroom afford? And here let's assume a Western, upper middle class, uh, suburban, vanilla kind of setting with a one bedroom per child sort of thing. So in the middle of the afternoon on a Sunday, the room affords play. So the child is in her room and she's playing with her blocks. Um, that's what the room affords. So again, there's all kinds of implicit and explicit cultural conventions about the kinds of toys uh, that a child might pick, but that's what the room affords. Now imagine uh, the same bedroom at a similar time when the parents are completely out of earshot. Now, depending on a few uh, different personality traits, for example, depending on the child's disposition, uh, that may not be entirely cultural, of course, uh, the same room might afford transgressive play. Say, if the child can reasonably infer that her parents cannot see her or cannot hear her, they might do things that they know they're not allowed to do. So the affordance in the room changes based on the assumptions and the inferences that the child can make about the authoritative agents that are likely to enforce a social norm. Namely, say you're not allowed to watch your iPad or you're not allowed to throw your Lego uh, up in the air. The same room, of course, once the beginning of the bedtime ritual becomes enacted, might certainly afford fussiness, fear, not wanting to go to bed. This is also learned pattern behavior. And there, if the parents are out of earshot. Now, again, granted, uh, a set of dispositional differences, um, and so on and so forth, if the parents are within earshot, um, and say if the child has re reasonably learned that crying works, then the room at night might afford crying loudly, and then the parents will keep coming back, uh, and then they'll keep begging, and they'll keep saying, no, you have to go to sleep, but the child will get to see her parents more. This is also a stable enough pattern affordance of the room based on inferences that can be made about, in this case, actual authoritative agents that are likely to enforce a social rule. An example that uh, we've given several times in our papers is the one of a red light. So a red light affords stopping for sure. But for some people, and there might be cultural and individual differences, a red light at four in the morning when there's absolutely no one around, you know that no one's watching, it might actually afford go through with caution you don't actually have to obey the affordance. So here what I'm trying to say is that the, the, the actual presence of the other minds and the classes of agents and their authority and epistemic authority status around is really important in modulating the status of affordances. But there are also, of course, and we're going to get there very soon, um, imaginary agents. Sometimes we simply summon uh, a general, generalized imaginary audience without needing to actually think, is there someone watching me right now? In order to problematize it a little more, I want to talk now a bit about individual differences uh, and individual personality differences, but also affective differences going through, uh, of course, too easy, but easy to think with examples of psychopathology.
so let's try to think about our affective baseline, what it feels like to be in a particular body, um, how we feel our moods and our emotions from moment to moment, and how those two might play a really strong modulating role in yielding different affordances. So I borrow this picture from uh, a famous paper uh, by Dehan, Reed, Velt, and colleague. So imagine an ecology of cues uh, anywhere, and these could be, I don't know, let's, let's say there are buildings in a city, you're walking through, uh, through a city, and you're not feeling particularly, your mood is neither high nor low, um, so there's not a whole lot of valence. Uh, it doesn't feel good or bad, it feels kind of neutral. You're on autopilot, this is what the city looks like to you. But now, imagine uh, a depressed person going through uh, anhedonia, sustained low mood, and inability to experience pleasure, all the clues might seem flattened. And the valence there might be, um, well, negative. It might, it might feel quite bad. Now, entropy is uh, something that we're very interested in, uh, particularly looking at the uh, variational free energy dimensions of the model. And didn't have time to talk about it very much. But entropy, in information theoretic terms, simply has something to do with the amount of possible states in an environment, in any given context or environment. So this is a very interesting dimension, very important, crucial dimension of understanding culture and ecologically in terms of affordances, because we need to think of the amount of possible things that we can do, things that we can feel, and things that we can imagine in an environment. So here, again, for an anhedonic depressed person, there's very low entropy. There's very few possible states, and there's this negative valence. So the world affords very different things. But now, say, uh, if you're in a different kind of depressed state, you're constantly ruminating, thinking about negative affect. Everything might seem dark and threatening. So the valence is low again, is negative, it feels bad, and the entropy is also low. There's very few possible states, and they're all bad. Uh, obsessive compulsive, a different kind of rumination. Now one cue might be made highly salient at the expense of other cues. You notice obsessively to one thing, you attend obsessively to one thing, like say whether it's clean or not, and you're completely oblivious to the rest. So here we have low entropy again. Now, if we think of the psychotic and schizotypal spectrum, so uh, having to do on recent accounts with making too many inferences about other minds. So if we're correct in assuming that the world and how we make sense of the world has something to do with other minds, well, on the schizotypal or schizophrenic end of that spectrum, we might do it a little too much. So a schizophrenic person uh, walking through this, this same city might see all kinds of hidden and dangerous cues everywhere, all kinds of intentions from others to harm him or her. So there, this entropy, there's many, many more possible states, but they also don't feel very good. Um, what we may call the ADHD trait, so high risk taking, high novelty seeking, uh, very flexible, sh attentional shifting, attending to many different things at the same time. There, the ADHD trait person might attend to many salient cues in a rapid fashion in no particular order. So there again, we have high entropy, many more possible states. The valence can be positive or negative. Uh, other things like passionate love, uh, definitely uh, a form of uh, obsession, pathological by many accounts. Um, so misleadingly seeing cues about the loved interest everywhere. Everything you see reminds you of the person or you, you think it's some kind of a message, um, a cosmic message about the person. So here we have, uh, my apologies, this should be low entropy and positive valence. Now, the final example that I'll give, um, let's go back to the sustained low mood. Let's go back to uh, the depressive mood and how it might yield different affordances in the environment, and let's problematize it a little. So far, I have been presented these different, and uh, we can be agnostic about whether they're traits or states, but these different modes of affect as somehow being belonging to different individuals, and I have left out the intersubjective component. I have left out the ways in which affect, emotions, and moods might also in many ways be outsourced to others, might also become meaningful, become predicted, become projected through our relationship with others. So let's go back to our anhedonic person, subject number one, who wakes up in the morning, many days in a row, experiencing sustained low mood. Now, how will that person 
create meaning out of that experience? How, how will that person know what to expect? What does it mean to have low mood? What will happen next? So invariably, as a social being, subject number one will draw on her experience and her knowledge of actual others who also experience sustained no mood. Uh, widespread cultural belief. So we live in a day and age where increasingly uh, we're talking about d depression as, as, as a chemical condition, uh, as, as a disorder. We have a set of expectations about what it means, what it entails, how we're supposed to feel. And, and we are validated in our beliefs in depression as a, a chemical condition that will make us remain sad for a very long time uh, through our interaction with actual and, and generalized others. So this is an interesting way to think about what philosopher Ian Hacking calls looping effects, which is how the beliefs that we hold about particular socially constructed categories have a way to loop back and affect our experience. Now, I like the time to get into a full debate on the ontological status of depression. It's a really, really complicated question. But we may briefly mention one parenthesis. So some of you might recall that uh, in 2008, the Harvard psychologist Irvin Kirch uh, elicited uh, quite a large controversy um, when he, under the Freedom of Information Act, uh, applied for the right to look at lots of unpublished uh, randomized control trials on the efficacy of serotonin inhibitor SSRI medications for depression. And he found that SSRIs barely did better than placebos across most trials. So the conclusion was, well, why are we using SSRIs if for people with moderate, mild, and uh, depressive disorder, it doesn't appear to work more than placebo? Now, they do appear to work for people with severe depression. That's, that's a different story. So there, there's been quite controversy. The controversy is ongoing. But now, 10 years later, um, some interesting things have been found. So SSRIs have actually become more effective by about 20%. But the placebo response has also become more effective. So what's going on? Anthropologists, people like Dan Moorman, the medical anthropologist, say, well, it appears that something has changed. In the past uh, 10 years or so, people increasingly come to take for granted that depression is a chemical illness that requires a chemical treatment. These, this is the expectations that we hold. 10, 20, certainly 30 years ago, the idea that you could take a pill and that it would make you feel happier was really counterintuitive. It's something that people would have had to think very carefully about, like, what do you mean? What is it going to do? It, something in my brain? Where? What? How does it work? Now, people routinely talk about their brains. Children talk about uh, a, their brain won't let them concentrate. So things have changed, things have crystallized in different ways. But here, and I'm also drawing on, on many years of work by uh, my colleague and mentor, Lawrence Kermeyer, on, on, on somatization, uh, metaphor, meaning mechanism, you know, and the cultural mediation of bodily experience. The way in which in attending interoceptively to what we feel, we, we cannot help but attribute meaning based on what we expect other people to also believe. And in this meaning, there's a set of predictions about how we're supposed to feel and what, what will happen next. And this, not entirely, but to a very large extent, shapes the quality uh, of our experience. So I'm going to conclude briefly, because I know that we're running over time. I wanted to simply, I apologize, problematize the notion of expectations a little more and point you in some directions to study people's implicit expectations if what you want to do is study culture uh, um, or the culture of a particular groups um, in particular. So we should point out that expectation is kind of a filler word to describe a broad range of responses from the fully automatic to the fully deliberate. So again, we may have some dogmatic expectations. I was expected to become a medical doctor. I was expected to marry a lawyer. And we may have some completely implicit expectations, like say, when we embody or exhibit an implicit bias response and, and against our explicit expectations, we find ourselves scared of a person because of what she's wearing or because of the color of her skin. So there, there's an automatic process also um, that we could also call um, an expectation. So, yeah, if, um, if, if I eat a chewing gum and my, my, I'm chewing a gum and then my stomach expects that food is coming and prepares a digestive response, that's a very completely implicit expectation. 
So I've talked already um, at length uh, about how we don't just expect anything from anyone. We are good at outsourcing expectations to authoritative others, people with epistemic authority that we associate with our in-group. But now the, the next question that I will point you towards is, well, what is the relevant in-group? What is uh, the relevant cultural groups? Because we might expect outsource some of our expectations to some groups, some to others, and uh, some might change over time. So for example, I uh, grew up in and out of Europe. Uh, my, my first language is French from France, but I spent a large part of my life in, in Latin America, different parts of, of North America. I identify with a community of, 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 of academics, of cognitive and social scientists. Um, I have some political preferences. So, so to whom do I outsource my taste, my values, and my beliefs? I mean, are these shaped in early childhood and infancy, or do they change later? This is a very, very, uh, very interesting question, very difficult question. But but what we should not do as social scientists or as cognitive scientists is assume that the very, the, what I call the obvious demographic markers like nationality, uh, ethnicity, age, uh, and so on and so forth constitute a base rate class of the relevant expectations that are being outsourced for people who belong to that group. Rather, we should investigate in different ways, in ways that probe at the implicit, that probe at the automatic, the kinds of expectations that people uh, really care about. So one way to do this, and I um, sadly will need to conclude soon, so I cannot spend too much time on this. Um, thankfully, uh, our colleague Jeffrey Snodgrass's presentation on field methods will discuss uh, cultural domains analysis, uh, cultural consonants, and the free listing method even more. But I'm simply now redirecting you to the, the Moses uh, example and this idea of the frequency bias, that ideas that come to mind automatically will tend to reflect ideas that are culturally widespread. And again here, let's be a little more than agnostic on whether or not people are always in every domain uh, authoritative about their own experience. And let's also accept that a lot of what people do is taken for granted. A lot of the cultural norms that people outsource their behavior to might be implicit and that they may not know. But we, there may be some methods to elicit, to bring those out of their mind, uh, to bring those out of their mind. So as it turns out, um, it's not difficult to do that. And the free listing method that comes out of cultural domain analysis is a very easy way to find out what people are thinking. So pick any cultural domain, things like romantic life, or family life, social support, career, um, materialism, for example, and simply ask people, well, say, in your culture, what are the kinds of things that you're supposed to have um, in order to be a full member of, of your culture. So that would be one way to do, one way to ask something like this. Or if you want to find out people's uh, ideas about gender, for example, ask them, well, when you think about a man, what are the common attributes of the man? Describe what a man does, for example. Now, once you have picked a particular uh, cultural domain, a particular subject that you're interested in studying, ideally, you will bring together you know, uh, a big enough focus group, but first you will qu query people individually. The reason for this is that focus groups are really interesting for generating uh, co conversations and to see if a consensus might arise or might already exist, but they also tend to flatten out individual differences. So first, simply ask people, list the first items that come to mind about this particular X, so say about the things you're supposed to have in the house. Now, when you compare people's answers, if you find that one particular item keeps recurring, in particular, if that item is really high on the list. So if every person you talk to first tells you right away, you have to have a TV in the house. Now, you may accept that you're onto something that you're picking up on, on an item, on an idea, on a value, on a norm, as it were, that is culturally widespread. So that's it, in a nutshell, the free, the free listing method. Uh, and then there are other ways, uh, there, there are 
other dimensions to this method that my colleague Jeffrey Snodgrass will talk about more eloquently than I can and at greater length, such as pile sorting, for example. So once people have individually uh, given items, once you have an idea that some items are more salient than others, well, feed them back to your informants as a group and tell them, sort them into piles. And let's see if you can all agree which, one, which ones are the, more, are the most important. And from there, you might arrive at some kind of a cultural consensus. And, and you might even discover uh, a new cultural domain. So, OK, well, it seems I've, I've spoken enough, uh, so I'm going to have to close very soon. These are, um, I wanted to show you uh, a few of our recent publications applying the cultural affordances model. So this was in, in 2016, Frontiers in Psychology, our uh, first iteration of the cultural affordances model. Mm. We've also uh, used it briefly and modestly to examine the questions of how depression might present itself uh, around the world um, and broader questions about the phenomenology of psychiatric disorders. This is from our very brilliant colleague, Maxwell Ramstead, uh, applying uh, rather the free energy dimension of, of this model to the question of life and the dynamics of living system, having something to do with the outsourcing of expectations, informations, and minimizing surprise. Uh, Lawrence Kumeyer's comments on Maxwell's paper, my own modest comment uh, attempting to understand how societies, uh, as they change and become more complex over time, need to maintain some kind of homeostatic uh, simplicity. Um, uh, there are the recent paper that I mentioned earlier on the hypersocial dimensions of, of smartphone dimension, and also a description of the social rehearsal account uh, of cognition. Um, here, another application to niche construction uh, more generally. And now a paper currently in review, which we hope will be out soon, uh, where we really present uh, in a lot more nuance, a lot more detail, uh, the many different dimensions of cultural affordances, um, summing it up as, well, thinking through other minds. I think I will close here. Thank you. <laughs>